going to finish today on a very positive note. Because despite the challenges we have identified today and the experiences that we have had this past year, we have, feel we have reason to be very positive. Daisy Beaudetois from Kingston University is going to tell us all about her doctoral project on craft on social media to engage the next generation. Thank you very much, Mr. Clarks, for inviting me today. Maybe a little bit of a risk um, because we're going to talk about something slightly different, which is content creation. But luckily, it's actually I'm going to address some of the things that we've mentioned today, which is social media has seemed to have come up quite a bit in in all the discussions. But there, I, what I found that there's often not much information on actually how to make content or how to participate online. And that's something that I think is um, really important because young people are present on social media, very clear. People are very inspired by what they see on social media. The act of content creation is a, a craft in itself. It's a whole separate still, skill set that people need to develop and learn. The skill set, it requires time, it requires community, and what we were saying earlier, it requires um, respect. And luckily, young people are digital natives. So if you want to participate online, you don't have to do it yourself. You can actually uh, provide an opportunity to bring a young person in, um, get them to make TikToks or whatever the current social media is of the time, trust them to play and experiment, and then give them time and agency in order to develop their skills. Because then you can also have the power of a platform to build community, foster engagement, and bring people to your cause. So I'm Daisy, a PhD student at Kingston University. My uh, topic is on the craft of content creation, and I'm specifically looking at online communities, online craft communities. Um, I also make content on Instagram and TikTok. I've got like 140,000 followers on TikTok and less on Instagram, whatever that means. And I use those platforms to talk about my own creative practice. And although my social media is not as hot as Denzel Curry, who was, um, there, there you go, um, uh, but, and, I'm, and I don't have all the answers today on how you guys can go viral overnight, but at least in this short little 20 minute talk, we can have a little conversation about introducing you to thinking about social media in a way that's social, and uh, thinking about content creation that's about creation. Okay, so of course I have to um, declare that um, participating in online spaces, there's so many negative aspects to it. So we're gonna put that aside for today, because we know, you know, your data's being mined, um, it's a lot of free creative labor that's ultimately profiting the tech overlords. Um, it's really hard to compete online with big businesses who have lots of staff and lots of money to pay for advertising. And then of course there's the almighty algorithm, which um, provides barriers. It could also be a really interesting um, like way for you to rethink your creativity if you learn how to kind of ride the wave of the algorithm. While social media is in some way democratic, it has um, enable people to bypass traditional gatekeepers like the gallery and the broadcaster, which has changed who's making and, and what they're making, which is quite interesting. Um, there are obviously, um, you know, you can't ignore the fact that there are barriers. But today, four days, I obviously don't have to try and convince you what the value of the craft is or here, so you obviously really care like I do. Um, I don't have to elaborate on the decline in formal craft education, which is incredibly sad. And I don't have to try and convince you that it's economically challenging to convince young people to consider a future in heritage crafts. But what I can do today is try to uh, get you to think about the way that we can use powerful platforms to educate, powerful platforms to broadcast literally into the homes of millions of people across, across the world. And these are skills that young, many young people already know and they already have in some shape or form. In fact, what's interesting is that despite the decline in formal craft education in the UK, the 2020 Market for Craft report stated that the amount of people under the age of 35 who are, craft, who are buying craft has doubled. So that's uh, like a whopping 9.1 million young people are joining the market. So people are definitely very interested. They're definitely participating. And this report came out before the pandemic, before people were locked inside, forced to go online to connect, and with a lot of additional time to indulge in the pleasure of, of you know, craft activities. Although the report also did note that back three years ago, uh, the crafters have already acknowledged the challenges that come with dedicating time and resource towards learning um, how to use social media, so that's obviously like a learning barrier, um, and the fact that it does take a lot of time in your own practice on top of your craft practice. So yes, um, content creation can be draining, it can be resource intensive, but if the right person 
is behind a, a social media account, and they love what they're posting about, and they have the freedom to experiment and develop their skills, and they're present in the place that they're making content about, then content creation can actually be a very liberating act. Okay, so I'm gonna show you just a short little video on some examples of what you might find on TikTok. Uh, bear with it, it can be, it's, a, it's an interesting environment, and for those of you who aren't present online, if you take a look at the phone here, I want you, when I'm showing you the videos, to just take a look at the like engagement metrics on the, on the right-hand side. So you'll see the heart, which is how many people actually click like, the little speech bubbles, comments, the little save icons, how many people saved it, and then share how many people that your video or the video is being shared to. The most ruthless people on the internet are people that do crochet tutorials. Because they hold no prisoners, they have zero mercy. They're like, first row, you're gonna do 20, H, D, C, L, B, C, H, T, E, L, T, E. Next row, you're gonna do 30, H, D, C, E, G, T, B, C, L, E, F, M, G. And then when they're showing you how to do it, they're like, and they put on like the most grating iMovie music on loop that you can imagine. To the point where it's like, this isn't even about teaching me, this is just about power. This is kind of like some kind of kinky power play here that you hold the knowledge and you're dangling it right in front of my face. But I can't have it because I have to be in the know. And that's kind of a slay. We go make some pottery. See, this is what I need. It is instructions. We're gonna try to make a cup. We're gonna just do that. And we probably would not have computers today if it weren't for thousands of years of weaving technology, mostly developed by women, and culminating in the invention of the jacquard boom. Weaving is a pattern of whether you send your wet feet or me. It's early 2020, and it seems like everyone has magically decided to make rugs. And you think to yourself, I want to go to there. But then you look up how much machinists to actually take you there, and you're like, LOL, never mind. But all the rugs you could be making haunt you in your dreams. So you do a little bit more research, and you find out about this thing called a punch needle. So you go to try and find a punch needle kit, but it's not included in the kit. So you get a punch needle and it doesn't work with the kit that you got. And you're like, what the heck? Why do people have things that require batteries in the punch needle kits? And then you get them and it doesn't work. Anyways, you're still determined. So you go back home again and you find out about the right kind of cloth, the right kind of punch needle, and finally everything's clicking. It's magic. You're making the rugs of your dreams. And people start asking questions and you're like, you know what? I'm just gonna make kits. How hard could it be? Okay, here's this vest that I made that's basically an Instagram break post that's hand knit with all this wool that I hand dyed. This little beauty is a pair of butter and scissors. They are characterized by the gap between the pinch and the middle of their blades, which allows me to cut button holes into clothing without cutting across the hem. However, these don't work just yet. This pair marked Unity Sheffield was made by the Sheffield Cutlery Cooperative, which ran for 100 years before closing their sites at the intersection between Air Street and Minnesota Street, which is now a car park. The company was run as a worker co-op, which meant the factory and brand was owned and run by the workers, with the surplus value and the form of profits split amongst them. After a quick grinding and polishing session, I think these scissors came out perfectly. And then tap the scissor blades over before edging. And then this is how they're meant to work. Really proud of these scissors as the maker's mark remained essentially untouched. Skip, skip. But when does this game get good? I do not use the word craft anymore. I don't allow people to say it to me. I won't respond to No disrespect to this creator at all because I totally understand where she's coming from. But when I use the word craft to describe what I do, I mean it as a threat against the boring ass art world. Like the art world, specifically the Western art world, has had to move goalposts so many times in order to stay relevant and denigrate hand skills like, oh, now we're conceptual. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, like in Asia and in the Middle East, don't have this hierarchy of decorative and craft and fine arts and all these levels of like what is valuable or not. So anyway, the point is not that I'm anti-art at all, but I'm anti-snooty hierarchical art world. So anyway, watch out because crafters are coming for you, art world. We're coming. <laughs> That's kind of what it's like being someone online. It's like being present at a party where if you're at the party, you know what's going on at the party. But when you look at how much engagement these people are getting, <coughs> making content mostly from their bedrooms, um, if you think about if we want to exhibit some work or 
broadcast the message? How quickly can you get your message to hundreds, thousands, or millions of people? So it's a very, very powerful space, and people are already are already active on it. And what's interesting is the first video of the guy with the, the crochet tutorial. And um, the fact that six thousand people thought that was really funny, like they they clicked like, and then. I love this comment on the video, 6,000 little likes. I found looking for grandma hands is the best for beginner tutorials because they've taught their children to do this. You know, so people online are very much engaged with the discussions of how can we learn, you know, which ways can we access the knowledge and how can we teach each other or create our own paths into, you know, a sector that we're all very interested in. So one of the things I wanted to ask is can crochet be a gateway craft to heritage crafts? If, you know, because obviously we saw a lot of crocheting and Bible arts, we read a lot of American accents in some, in some of the content there. And um, imagine that these people are doing this with their spare time in their bedrooms, what they could be doing it if you could provide a platform for them, if you could provide, um, if you could support them and give them, give them, you know, give them some kind of industry skills while they're doing what they're best at. So maybe you're slightly inspired um, uh, by, by what you've seen, or you might feel a bit frustrated because you tried social media and maybe it didn't work the first few times you posted content because that can be quite frustrating. But what we need to acknowledge is that content creation is a craft. It is a separate act. It requires skill. And if you think of David Pye's notion of workmanship, it's about managing risk. The more you make content and the more you're kind of present in these spaces, the better you get, the more confident you get, the better you get at managing that risk. So you can't just give a master crafter a mobile phone and um, some internet access and expect them to go viral overnight. It has happened before, but we can't, you know, we can't just expect that it's something that someone can immediately do. So while the videos you watch appear to be effortless, it's perhaps not the first time these creators were making content. They probably spent a lot of time in these spaces watching learning from others, understanding the visual aesthetic of the space, knowing the insider jokes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a constant process of learning, experimentation, and improving what you've done previously to produce better results. And it would be remiss of me today not to actually do a little like making session, because this is the Museum of Making. So how could you make content? Or if you're bringing someone in, how can you appreciate what goes into making content? Tools. This is just a little list of tools that I have in my toolkit. Um, smartphone good battery, uh, some storage space, a, a, a decent camera, a little tripod, you can get one second hand, go onto Facebook Marketplace. A little lapel mic is amazing, um, very affordable, great for doing audio, audio can be very important. Portable battery if you're shooting remotely, and sometimes a light, because you know the lighting in this country is always great. Um, software, so a friend of mine who's a craft influencer says that she has a, a little like folder on her phone that she looks at as a sewing, as like a sewing box. So in her little sewing box, she'll have editing features, editing apps. So for photo editing, I use Snapseed. You may have a different app. For graphic design, which is like making posters, you know, a little image with nicely laid out text. Canva, or most, all mostly free apps. Video, I personally use CapCut, really easy to use. And this is controversial, but there is a new tool on the market, ChatGPT. Don't hate it until you've tried it. Very good for brainstorming and thinking through some ideas, even writing a little audio, just you know, a little voiceover for a video if you're, trying, if you're like stuck with what you could write. And then obviously um, use YouTube to learn how to use all the apps. And there's a really great podcast that I listen to called Social Minds by Social Chain, weekly for social media marketing, uh, great interviews. And then Mary McGlugory gave a wonderful talk at the Museum Next conference about how, content, how museums and galleries can work with content creators. And she's also compiled a list of content creators who are interested in working with industry. So very great resource. You can take a picture of the screen or ask for, me later, ask for it later and I'll send you the information. So I like to talk about making content like knitting a jumper. Theoretically, everyone can knit a jumper. You can pick up knitting needles and some yarn and, and knit, but not everyone wants to. And not everyone can do it well immediately, but with some time, you can get better at knitting your jumper. It's the same with patterns. With content creation, there are patterns to it. If you're present online, you will understand the way that people speak in those spaces. You can't just turn up at the party and take over the party. So there's definitely patterns of behavior online that you need to follow as if you were you know, knitting that jumper. Um, and these are kind of three things that the soothsayers on social media like to say you can use to help you think about the content you create. Are you making educational content? Is it entertaining? That's like taking part in the little memes. And um, is it aspirational? And within the craft community, these we can address all three of these in, in how we want to share what we are, what we are, what, in, what interests us. When someone lands on your account, you need to think what conversation does it start? Because social media is social. And to understand this, you have to think about 
the internet and its evolution. The internet, Web 1.0, between 1990 and the 2000s, was mainly websites. So you mainly broadcast from a website. And David Gortman talks about it like a garden. Everyone has separate gardens. But the world of social media, which is known as Web 2.0, is like allotments. We're all in it together. I'm on Instagram, you're on Instagram, we follow each other, we see each other's content. You know, we're kind of, it's an allotment. But then the question is, what next? So Web 3.0 has kind of been co-opted by Bitcoin and the whole world that I'm not too familiar with. But I have noticed an evolution in social media that would be valuable for you to think about today when making content. And that's been introduced, I mean, this is no, not set in stone, these are my thoughts, but by TikTok. So on Instagram, it's social first. We follow each other, we see each other's content. On TikTok, it's interest first. So I sit back, a bit scary, but I sit back and the machine delivers content to me in like a scroll. I don't expect to see people I follow. But very quickly, within two hours apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, within two hours the machine learns what your interests are. So just because you like dog videos doesn't mean you just get sent dog videos. It's very, very smart, very scary, selling your data sold to the devil, but um, it's very, very smart. And what that means is that if you start creating content, and you do it on the regular, the machine's gonna work very hard to take your content to the people who want to see it. It's gonna do that work for you because that's its USP. That's how, it, unfortunately, it does keep people hooked. But if you use it for good, then, you know, it kind of like uh, takes out the like, negative of it. Talking about the machine, which I know is scary, we can't not talk about the third aspect, so tools, patterns, and um, the algorithm. So the algorithm is very scary um, because no one really knows what the algorithm is doing. But there are a few things you can do in order to kind of ride the wave of the algorithm instead of letting it like knock you over. So when you're making content, it could be beautiful, you can have a great story, it could be you know, something that you think people want to know about, but it's not gonna go anywhere if you're not like pleasing the gods of the algorithm. So it's like a harvest. If you want a good harvest, you gotta do a little sacrifice, right? So when I post content, I think, what music is trending today? And you can figure these things out. You know, are there any trends that I can participate in? Are there any hashtags that are relevant that will help me get an edge on? Uh, are there any new features that the apps want you to push? So pleasing the gods of the algorithm is a way for you to then take creative control of the process and use it, use it to your advantage instead of being uh, frustrated by not getting the reach that you would like. So good storytelling, visually appealing, make it about community and, and working that algorithm are all tools that will help you to make content. And whether you're hiring someone or if you're experimenting yourself, you also need to remember that taking risks also means making mistakes. And actually that's fine because two years ago I made um, a TikTok about the extinct heritage crafts and it blew up pretty quickly. And very quickly I learned that uh, sort of prospect making is definitely not a dead craft. It's just not practiced in the UK. And I could have taken that as a moment to like beat myself in the back and be really embarrassed and say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, it's too vulnerable. But I actually took the opportunity to make a video that's linked to the first video where I was able to address, and I did my own learning, and I was able to talk about the process and, and so on. So, you know, make, taking risks can bring rewards, but can also, you know, make you a bit vulnerable, but, um, you know, it shouldn't let you stop you from, from, from having a voice or, or being creative. For all its faults, social media is here to stay and we do need to embrace it in some way or another, especially since last year, the New York Times data for Generation Z, which is people born from 96 to 2010, um, they, actually, they are actually going to TikTok to Google instead of Google. They, young people are going to social media to find out information, and if you're not there, then you're not the information they're gonna find out about. So it is something that we have to take more seriously instead of just going, oh, it's just something that someone does on the couch on, in their bedroom, or like in their bedroom or on the couch in their home. It's actually very serious business. So um, in conclusion, content creation should be recognized as a craft with all the skills associated with it. Um, perhaps organizations could find ways to have content creators in residence, not connected to marketing, not bringing a young person in to go and advertise all the lovely aspects, but perhaps an opportunity for a young person to have access to the facilities, be able to talk to people, and to make creative work using social media. And then they get the opportunity to develop copywriting skills, they can work within a wider organization, they can interview people, there's um, editing, SEO, curating. So it's, a really, it's a really great a way to think about how can we learn from young people rather than what skills can we give to young people. And then individual crafters should also experiment, um, you know, take risks, make sure to have fun. And a, something great to kind of end the talk off with is that um, rug tufting was an endangered craft and fulfilled 2021 list. 
And then it was found out that it was actually alive and well because of social media, or on social media, young people were taken up the activity, inspired each other to participate, and now it's currently viable. So it does have impact. And then finally, just something to think about when, you know, for, to end the day. How are we going to recognize these young craft content creators in the archives, in museums and galleries? What are we going to be learning about in art, art history in the future? Are we going to be saying this young person was creating this art and um, all this craft, and we think they were following this person at that time, but currently we're not actually recognizing the very important role that content is playing in shaping what young people are interested in and how they're connecting with each other. <laughs> so yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, you can contact me if you want to know more. 20 minutes is not enough time to get all the details. But yeah, it was great to chat to you today.